I'm Jan Worm and we're in my studio in Berkeley right now and I'm very happy that Wendy Martin is here with me today and that we'll be having a conversation about art, life, the creative life, mm -hmm. um, women in contemporary society and anything else that crosses our minds and our, um, our day today. Yeah. Is it hard to let, like someone wants to buy it, is it hard to let it go because it's, you know, so much a part of you and even though you've got, you know, many others, do you, do you feel any pang as if someone kind of <laughs> puts it in their car or their truck or whatever and hangs it on their wall and maybe you never see it again? No. 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 I <laughs> out of the studio into the world. Uh -huh. I, I don't need to, to live with them. Uh -huh. No, I, you know, I, I, I don't, um, I don't hang on them and I don't need them. Uh -huh. uh, I don't, um, I'm not really doing them for myself. I mean, while I'm doing them, I'm, I, I love painting, so yeah. that's really great. Yeah. But I'm not doing them to have objects for myself. Mm -hmm. They're not objects. They're really about communication. Mm -hmm. So they're meant to be out there for people yeah. to be um, responding to. Or, yeah. um, you know, what, what would I like people to get from them? Um, joy, solace. Um, some humor, mm -hmm. any number of things. What, what would you say, you know, being an accomplished and productive artist, that um, you would like to see happen in the larger culture in regard to the arts in general, in regard to visual arts? Do you feel that there's a sufficiently developed um, responsive community to art? Do you feel that artists are living precarious lives and under supported in terms of, you know, funding or, or audience or, you know, res just resources in general to, to get their work out there? You know, your question just brings up <coughs> so many problems and they're all, they're all really huge in, in, in our society uh, of, of um, not valuing <clears throat> the art, the artists, and the importance of art in people's lives and, mm. and what it does. And it starts with the children in school and um, how really um, valuable this is yeah. for their development, for the, their um, communication, for their learning, for um, emotional and intellectual development. And so we don't value it enough to support it in the schools. Yeah. Uh, we don't value <clears throat> our young artists as they're yeah. developing. Uh, there's no reason for art education. I mean, and they have to wait to have it. There's no reason for it to be so extraordinarily expensive and inaccessible. Yeah. Um, there's, uh, I mean, the idea that art isn't being presented, incorporated in the public sphere, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking about one percent of art for new buildings, public buildings going yeah. for art. Um, in, in that kind of public art is really an extension of. Uh, I'm sorry, for the most part, it has traditionally been, for exception, it's been a traditionally um, ex an extension of um, the architecture mm -hmm. and and, mm -hmm. and the environment. Yeah. But in terms of supporting artists and their development in in their studios and in their practice and, and in their lives, you know, we've just seen that fall by the wayside. Yeah. You know, loss of the NEA individual artist grants foundations don't want to grant individually to artists for the most part. I mean, there are some foundations set up by artists who recognize that. And so yeah. is their legacy there supporting that. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, just when you look at the whole social spectrum, you know, and where money and support goes and value and what we deem as being really important, it's all, um, yeah. you know, just, not eradicating art, but it really is is not supporting and, and, and yeah. promoting it. I mean, so. it does seem that we are becoming, for whatever reason, the pressures on our educational system and society in general increasingly pragmatic. It's ironic at a time when we have more resources than ever 
in fact, to work with um, culturally. Uh, you know, there's this reductionist move to be practical, have kids learn, you know, programming or you know, computer programming or whatever, so they can get a job. And yet, that part of the market is actually changing so rapidly that whatever they're learning in in, in high school or college will be probably irrelevant by the time they get out and actually look for a job. The whole technology will have changed sufficiently if they learn all over again. So I don't know. I find it very odd that, um, that the arts seem to be so devalued in this particular, it's a huge pressure to, as you say, just um, set them aside. Yeah. Um, I, and, I, and again, ironically, the, the more, you know, the technology provides opportunities for leisure, you would think the more uh, art would be, more important uh, the role of art would be in our lives. And yet there seems to be this sort of counter move. It's disturbing. But do you feel this in your own life? I mean, in terms of, I mean, you get fellowships and you get residencies and so forth, but um, do you find that it's really challenging to move forward, get your work out there, sustain yourself economically. Um, what, what do you think the future, you know, the present and future possibilities are for artists right now? Uh, you know, I, I think that it's really, really so much harder for young artists now because, um, for one thing, um, the housing market has changed so much. Yeah. And... Um, when I came out of school, well, first of all, no one had the kind of debt that kids are coming out of art school. They, they're not going to get a yeah. job that can repay that, yeah. you know, yeah. as they could in other fields. Yeah. But finding studio space, we could find cheap studio space. We could find, you know, huge spaces for very little money. Yeah. Um, we, um, you know, just survival was not that difficult. It was mm -hmm. a lot easier. Yeah. The cost of living has just skyrocketed and so so that's really difficult um, you know we talked we talked a little bit about um, grants and fellowships that were available that uh, have really diminished but um, as you know I, I'm working in in an art center now I'm at the Richmond Art Center yeah. and in my capacity as um, the director of exhibitions and the curator there I get proposals from artists and so I see the huge, huge um, need, the hunger, really, for showing work, for being included, for having an opportunity. And, you know, we're limited. We're one facility. Mm -hmm. We have this space. We have our commitments to the community. We have member shows and student shows and um, the Art of Living Black and the Ceramics and Glass Association has a show. And so when it comes to, you know, having the gallery spaces where we can curate and put in work, we're very limited and certainly not able to bring in all of these artists who are working seriously over long periods of time, developing really impressive bodies of work. It is really difficult. And because most institutions are facing really severe um, financial um, constraints because funding yeah. from government sources, foundation sources, everything is shrinking. It's all being redirected into other areas because you know, art just does not have that um, weight. There are social services, education, training programs, that's where it's going. And I'm not making a judgment about yeah. one being more valuable than the other, <coughs> but one is being excluded. Um, so for that reason, many reasons, um, cost primarily, a lot of institutions are extending the length of exhibitions. So whereas um, in the past, oh. a, a, a show might have had a duration of three or four weeks and you have a change every month or even every three weeks, now you have exhibitions that last two months, oh. sometimes two and a half months or mm -hmm. three months. So that cuts the number of possibilities in half right there. Right. And so you see everything, you know, it's, it, it's a domino effect. So you see everything affecting the next thing down the line, and ultimately the artist is there saying, well, where can I show, where can I sell, where can I teach? 
Mm -hmm. You know, all of these things are, are really impacting the life of the artist and, yeah. and, and therefore our culture, mm -hmm. quite frankly. Would you say, I mean, that I didn't know. Uh, it's very interesting about extending the length, the duration of an exhibit just to save money and, and so forth. Would you say, um, for example, people complain about uh, increasingly how in the arts, um, I mean, this could be in the area of literature and music as well, that um, fewer and fewer people get represented, that we have, a, you know, it's often referred to as the star system, so that we kind of put all of the audience energy and attention um, directed to a very few people, that there isn't like a wide range of, of, um, of artists available. I, I'm thinking, say, in the world of jazz, where uh, and now, of course, it's a very, very small audience, but any kind of popular music, I suppose, uh, where one or two people kind of take the place of hundreds and one mm -hmm. or two people become the media darlings and everybody else is kind of uh, relegated to a much uh, mm -hmm. less uh, visible um, uh, um, position. What, what do you, I mean, what do you make of that, that, that kind of reduction of, of, you know, that, yeah. that I, I, I'll tell you why I asked this. I remember once being in Paris with my daughter, who was at the time, I think probably about 10 or 11, and we were in um, Musée d'Orsay, and we, it was an evening, uh, uh, they were open on Thursday evenings, I think, and we had the entire gallery of, I think it was Van Gogh, uh, to ourselves. It was just the two mm -hmm. of us, and I said to her, Laurel, Laurel, this is really special. We may never, ever have this experience again. And she said, well, Mom, I'm not sure that, you know, so few people, so few artists should be represented in this museum. I mean, it's great to be in this room. He's a great artist, but there are a lot of other good people, too, who might be on mm -hmm. the walls. Mm -hmm. I was really stunned. I didn't know what to make of it. Mm -hmm. But even as a child, she was, she recognized how few people were really available for people, mm -hmm. that they became iconic and kind of fulfilled a symbolic function and that, um, in a way, people I don't know, depend on that. Oh, well, I, I know who the great artists are, mm -hmm. these five, and the others are just mm -hmm. sort of, you know, yeah. not there. And I, do you, is that, it seems like it's even more so today. I, I don't know. But you would think, again, with all the technology available, like people being able to put their work on YouTube or um, create videos or whatever, that there'd be more possibilities. But... I don't know that it's worked that way. Uh, this is, I think this is really interesting because it brings up, brings up a couple of things, different things, uh, to kind of backtrack a little bit mm -hmm. about um, this tendency to promote just a limited number of artists or musicians or just yeah. artists here um, or, or writers. So I think what happens is that for one reason or another, very often, um, you find people who are very comfortable and secure with promoting someone who's already been validated. Yes. So um, the number of people who are willing to sort of stand for someone who mm -hmm. is, has not been validated and is unknown is pretty limited, the people mm -hmm. who go out and find new people for the first time. So you have this... Um, basically, um, I don't want to say that they're insecure, but they feel a lot more comfortable standing behind people who've already been validated. And so what you get is you get this um, snowballing effect, momentum, and those people are recognized, they've had the shows, and they get the grants, and they get the awards, and they get the, you know, and it builds. Mm -hmm. And then everyone congregates, knows, and is also validated in knowing somebody who they know is good as yeah. opposed to some unknown person. Yeah, so right. even for the gallery goer to stand in a gallery and, and see you know, somebody who's never been shown before in a small gallery rather than in you know, a major gallery, do I stand behind this? Do I like this? Is this good? You know, the judgment is always a very public kind of thing, different from the, the private. And the, one of the consequences of that is that not only are those other artists not shown, 
but they don't have the same opportunity to develop. Yeah. Because when you're shown and you get critical response and you have conversation with, and you're in a dialogue, a yeah. public dialogue, you grow as an artist, whether it's in your writing or in your music because you're performing more and you're having more interaction and you're with other musicians and you're rising to another level. And so you have this double effect of, you know, not only are you creating these stars, but you're also enabling them in a certain way that the others are being, they're being disadvantaged. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's, it's all feeding into the system, in, you know, on many different levels. Yeah. And, um, and then what happens is that when you kind of look back after, you know, you, a few steps and then you look back and you see that in fact there are discrepancies and disparities. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing greater talent here and not as much here because, and with time, it increases this disparity because these people haven't been given the opportunities to develop in the same ways that they might have developed had they had these opportunities. That's not to say that there aren't people who are, you know, stars that are created that don't have the same talent and people who aren't created as stars and have just as much talent. But you do create this, this you know, institutionalized disparity. Mm -hmm. of opportunity yeah. and we know this in education we know this in the arts too it's the same thing yeah. Yeah. so um, it's problematic it really is and um, that, that, that's one reason why you know I, I think alternative spaces for young artists are very important and cultural centers and university galleries but again at some point you hit kind of a glass ceiling with mm -hmm. this. yeah so you have these two spheres, and some people transition into the other one, you know, yeah. and some don't. And and of course, you know, as you say, the problem becomes intensified <coughs> with time. Also, you know, history kind of over, you know, has has a way of losing. I mean, people's mm -hmm. records, and you know, once the generation has passed, yes, you have got some scholars who will go back and kind of dig through the archives. But it's very hard to recreate, uh, you know, any given historical period and and find out, you know, who every who everyone was. Who, who are the people who were there? You, know, you see it in all, and you see it in history in general. But if you look back, for example, at the femin you know, second wave of feminism, and that was a huge grassroots movement. And it, you know, what 30, 40, 50 years later, it, it, you get maybe ten or twenty important people who are listed in every else is forgotten it's mm -hmm. it's a it's a real problem um, but uh, well perhaps perhaps it'll become less so I, I don't know it seems to me it would take a very conscious effort to and I would say here technology could make a difference where you had more people available you know on a, a, an art site where people mm -hmm. went to look for new artists or People put their work on YouTube, and I mean, it might be that there would be more, you know, more possibilities available in the future. But it's hard to say. It is. Well, I mean, I I think about Facebook, for instance. Yeah. So um, when I went on Facebook, which was many years ago, you know, I think I liked it when I had about forty to fifty friends, and I could. Um, you know, see what they were reading, what they were posting. Uh, they referenced uh, exhibitions in New York. They had comments. They put up images. They put up their own work. It, you know, it was kind of nice. I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. When it got to 100 and 200, it was still fun. But I knew that I, if I went on a day later or two days later, there was no way I could read in an hour through the postings yeah. of everyone. Yeah. And certainly now that I have over a thousand, you know, I have no idea. There's no way I couldn't. In, if I spent 24 hours of my day yeah. right there, I couldn't watch and read and look at all the artwork, the postings, the exhibitions, the commentary, the threads for the really interesting people. I mean, we all we all like reading Jerry Saltz's stuff and everyone, and we like adding to it and being in dialogue. There's no way that we can keep up with everybody in those numbers and I think that's what's happened with um, with all the art posting I mean it was great when there was like one blog that I could go to yeah, or two yeah, or three yeah. but if there are four or five that are interesting 
I can't do it. I don't have the time for it. Yeah. You know, and we're it's talking a full-time about full-time job. Are we, are, you know, we're, we can't read all the books that we want to read, and yeah. we can't yeah. go see all the exhibitions and the museums we want to see, yeah. Yeah. and we can't you know, see all our friends that we want to see at the same time. And we're talking about like real life friends too, much less, you know, be in the yeah. studio, you know, yeah. painting at our desk, writing our novels. Mm. And so, um, yes, I mean, it gives us the possibility. I don't know that we can take advantage of it. Yeah, that's a good point. I would not have. So. Uh, <laughs> I mean, this, this is very interesting because on one hand, you've got, the problem of the reducing valve and only, you know, a very small percentage of artists, you know, rising to national, international uh, uh, awareness, prominence, and so forth. And and you realize that some of it is arbitrary. I mean, you know, it just that certain artists, people are in the right place at the right time. And the more successful they are, the more successful they are, and so on and so forth. So you've got that problem. But on the other hand, you also have the problem of so many possibilities and uh you know as you say so many people posting and expressing themselves and i, I it's it, it's a say so somehow there has to be um what do we call it a, a um like an aggregator someone who you know is able to pull in a wide or, or system is able to pull in a wide range of artists but at the same time winnow so that there's a manageable not too not too small, but not not so it's so so many people weighing in that there aren't enough hours in the day to process it. Yeah. It's an interesting moment. You well know? that's that's why there have always been gatekeepers. Yeah. You know, and yeah. And, and, um, and I think uh, the, there were a number of of sort of points at which um, along the path there there were um, those gatekeepers to keep certain people out. And um, at one point it was, you know, a gallery. You were mm. with a certain gallery and that gave you access to the museum people. Yeah. And then there was a proliferation of galleries. I mean, yeah. you know, everyone says in the old days in New York you could go to all the galleries in one day and now there's uh -huh. 300. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, it goes mushrooms to, like, every city's got 300 galleries. Yeah. Um, then it was, you know, at one point it was the education system. If you had an MFA, mm -hmm. you know, that was it. Now the Everything. number of, of degrees given out every year is just astonishing. So you, you're looking for the next thing that's going to be a cutoff, that's going to somehow differentiate. And um, Well, that's a very interesting thing. My husband says, well, the age of the gatekeeper is over be because of the new technology uh -huh. and that people will vote with their... Feet. In other words, you you have all the possibilities out there. People have their websites and so forth. And then the people who, or if it's Amazon publishing book, you know, self-published books or whatever it happens to be. And there is a kind of interesting tension now between the traditional publishing houses and, and, and the other kinds of publication, which we used to call vanity presses. Right. But it's no longer that. It's It's called either self-published or subsidized publishing yeah. or something like that. But but what he says is, okay, people will, and this has happened. We see it with the Amazon um, uh, uh, offering. Some writers attract huge audiences. Some bloggers attract huge audiences, and then they get the attention of the traditional media. So maybe that will be, I mean, people, you know, you put yourself out there, and then you see how many people respond, and maybe that's, what's going to be uh, the, the way of the future. It'll be, I mean, it's a possible approach, but I agree it's a lot easier if you have someone kind of curating the possibilities and presenting, um, and, and certainly in the past publishers and literature, but certain publishers have gotten a certain kind of reputation for getting the newest, most interesting writers, we'll say. We'll say Scribner's and, Hemingway's time, or um, so I, again, but those processes don't stay the same over time. So we're obviously in an area, you know, an era where it's uh, changing quickly, but the shape it's going to take is not quite clear to me. But it may be that it'll be a matter of, you know, you put all your work, as much of your work as you can on YouTube, <coughs> and you see who 
who, how many, what do you call them, hits you get or followers mm -hmm. you have. Mm -hmm. And that may be, and maybe that's it. You've got to put yourself out there. I mean, I certainly, I told one of my, oh, I'm involved in poetry awards at, at Claremont, Tufts Poetry Awards, and I'd say to young poets, hey, have someone record you uh, and put your put yourself up on YouTube and see see if you get any people who come by and mm -hmm. listen to your stuff. You know, it's better than just collecting the poems, you know, in your desk in a drawer and you know, or even if you have a publisher, there are just so many small presses now, and so many people publishing. You know, you just you've got to be as aggressive as possible putting yourself out there. So, like, do you have do you have like a tour of your Gallery, a virtual gallery if, that you've put on YouTube or on the internet? I uh, no, I don't. But I I uh, have um, I do have a channel. I have a uh -huh. YouTube channel, uh -huh. and I do have a series of um, of videos on there. So I had a documentary made um, in two thousand and eight mm -hmm. um, by a documentary filmmaker who did it for me. I mean, she didn't do it for me. She 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 did it. She contacted yeah. me. It, um, I, I didn't like pay somebody to do this. Right, right. Um, and then there are videos from um, you know speaking to a group at an exhibition, mm -hmm. or um, there are videos sections from symposia that are on there. And then I have a series of small videos of drawings that were just made to music that are just kind of like mm -hmm. little animated movements of of drawings. So there, there are bits and pieces on YouTube. That but have are there. you had someone come, for example, and photograph these large canvases, say a hundred of them, you know, choose the hundred you like the most, and then just have a slideshow that people could go through? No. Why not? <laughs> that strikes me as a really good idea. That is a good idea, Wendy. What you a great idea. It. <laughs> That's a good idea. You should do that. I think it's, what a good idea. I think it's the only way to ever yeah. Get that material out before people. And, you know, every time I come to your studio, I see something new. It's like extremely um, exciting and, and dramatic visual experience, you know. I'd love to be able to um, have a slide of your work that I could just go back, you know, I say this painting right here. I'd love to be able to go back to it and see it over and over. That would be fun. But see, so what really did appeal to me was the book aspect. You know, we talk about um, about about self-publishing. Yeah. Kind of but um, so what I was able to do <coughs> was to um, to do my retrospective in print. So so I have all yeah, of this. Yeah, but I think you should digitize see, that. I'll be digitized, huh? Yeah, I think and so. Then, and they're sort You've of by, got by it segments. Prepared. Yeah, I've got it all. I think not. I think the work is done basically. You just need, you know, to get that in in digital form and post it. Anyway, so here you can see stuff from like 1970, 1968. Yeah, you know? and you Which can is, see. Oh wow, interesting. Oh, this is see, fascinating. See pattern. Yeah, Matisse. Well, yeah. Uh, anyway, you so, know, I I think you should put it in chronological form on the internet. On I the do. Internet. I think you've got to. I think there's just no doubt about it. So. I mean, I cannot tell you, for example. I'm Are we done? sorry, but I actually only have batteries. Okay. So I want to know how long you're going to. We're going to end right now. Yeah. We'll end right now. I okay. think. We'll, we'll, so with we'll that, with that so idea, yeah. I think we can, we can conclude. But I, I, even I, who am the technophobe of all time, <laughs> uh, can see that this is an obvious thing that you've got to do. Yeah. You take your work. You've already got it, um, uh, you know, in visual form, in book form, and. The audience then would be huge compared to how many people will get to see this. Will even know twenty five. That, well, that's right. How many people even know they're available, right? Five. So, okay. So this is this is like a no brainer. Yeah. Um, so, so you know, in this kind of dance, this ongoing dance between technology and and art uh, and the social complexities and various pr pressures, economic and political. You know, at least the artist has to figure out a way to to make the best of it, and at least make technology work for you. And that's that's what I'd say is a strategic defense um, and stance in general. Because going forward, you know, you get that out 
it lives forever. I mean, unless they completely demolish the, the, the digital archives, it's out there forever. And you don't even have to think about it once it's posted. All right. Unless, unless we just think that maybe it shouldn't be <laughs> forever. Maybe, you know, I, I mean, I like this point that Rem Coolhouse made about, you know, all this preservation. Maybe not everything should be forever. Maybe we need to make room for the new. Well, that's so, the problem as So well. somehow between them. Yeah. Well, for the moment. For the I moment. Would say, for the moment. Go forward. For this moment. <laughs> embrace your digital future. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you, Wendy. This has been a lot of fun. It has been. It has been a lot of fun. Very, very, um, very, uh, I've learned a lot, you know, extremely illuminating. I think um, that um, it's been a real pleasure and privilege to be able to hear and look at the paintings and hear you talk about how they've been, how they were created and, and think about the future of, of your paintings. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.